All right, welcome everyone. So um, today we're uh, having the second one of the Frontier Lectures. We have another one uh, next Tuesday and Thursday, and then after that, you guys will be giving the last Frontier set of lectures. So um, here we are. We talked about uh, single cell genomics last time. Today we're going to be talking about cancer genomics. And then on Tuesday, we're going to be talking about mining human phenotypes. And then next Thursday, we'll be talking about genome engineering, so from um, reading to writing. So uh, we talked about single cell genomics, and today we're going to be building a little bit on that. And then on Tuesday, we're going to be talking about uh, FIWAS and sort of how to think about disease across many, many different phenotypes uh, at the same time. So uh, today, the goal is cancer. And it deserves its own lecture because there's so many different types of processes that are contributing to cancer. And it also behaves in many, many ways very differently from a lot of these complex traits that we've talked about already. And I like this uh, lecture because it sort of brings together so many different processes that we've talked about already. On one hand, selection and common variants and rare variants. On the other hand, evolution and sort of rapid evolution and sort of new mutations and so on and so forth because uh, cancer has both. So first we're gonna talk about sort of the, hallmark, the hallmarks of cancer, basically some basic definitions to get the lay of the land of uh, oncogenes, tumor suppressors, and uh, sort of the, um, the pathway to cancer, if you wish. Then we're gonna talk about lessons from whole exome sequencing about recurrence and heterogeneity. Basically, recurrence means that many patients have mutations in the same set of genes or pathways. And heterogeneity means that, yes, sure, they do, but within each gene and pathway, those mutations differ from patient, from patient to patient. There's a lot of heterogeneity in those. Then we're going to talk about whole genome sequencing. So exome focusing, of, of course, on the protein coding genes whole genome focusing on the circuitry. And that, again, brings together the non-coding genome that we've been talking a lot about and, and convergence through these networks that we've talked about from individual mutations to enhancers to genes to pathways. Then we're going to go beyond the sequencing paradigm of mutations and talk about epimutations and sort of epigenomics and functional heterogeneity of cancer. Uh, of reprogramming those cancer cells to differ de differentiate them and sort of make them multi uh, potent again. And also talk a little bit about single cell sequencing that we heard about last week and how it applies to the concept, uh, to the context of cancer genomics. And then lastly, we're going to shift gears and talk about the relationship between the tumor and the immune system because uh, this is one of the most promising areas of therapeutics. And it has really sort of taken the world by storm in the ability to sort of really comprehend how is the tumor interacting with the immune system of the, of the host? And uh, how can we manipulate that relationship to really fight uh, cancer? So that's the menu uh, for today. Let's jump right in. So first of all, the hallmarks of cancer. So this is a paper that was written by Bob Weinberg and Doug Hanahan uh, about 20 years ago, and it was updated about 10 years ago. So I think it's about time for another Hallmarks of Cancer paper, and I'm sure Bob is working on it. Um, and this really provided a framework for understanding cancer biology. And in particular, uh, this framework is that uh, in the same way that when you're playing, I don't know, yeah, sir. Old enough, but I don't know if anybody remembers Myst. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but but there's like probably a dozen games like that that I should be mentioning instead for uh, you guys. But this concept that you're you're sort of landing on an island in this video game and you have to assemble a set of things to sort of fix your spaceship and take off. And what do you need to assemble? You need to assemble, you know, one of these things and one of those things and one of those things and so on and so forth. So you're basically assembling a bunch of Alice Man that you want to then sort of put together to gain all the capabilities that you need to make your spaceship fly. And cancer is very much the same way. It needs to acquire a set of capabilities without which it's no good as a cancer cell. 
Okay, what are these capabilities? That's exactly what this hallmarks of cancer paper tried to lay out. On one hand, to avoid apoptosis. So most cells, when they go, you know, uh, rogue, they're, uh, they, they, they launch their own suicide mission. And they basically say, oh, I don't seem to be behaving well anymore. I'm going to apoptose, uh, which basically means, uh, again, from the Greek means, you know, fall away from. Um, so um, they have to avoid apoptosis. Basically, there's signals for apoptosis that the organism sends to cells that, are, that have lost their way. And those cells basically commit harakiri and they, you know, they, they get then recycled. But the cancer has to figure out a way to avoid that. It has to figure out ways to become self-sufficient uh, in growth signals to basically proliferate, not only not die, but actually multiply. It needs energy to feed itself while it's doing that. So it needs to send signals to the body to send it more blood from the bloodstream. And therefore, it sends signals for sustained angiogenesis. It needs to... Uh, uh, stop listening to signals from the rest of the body that, that tell it stop growing. You're a post cell. Don't divide anymore. And it has to suppress those. It has to also figure out ways to invade tissues and to multiply and to metastasize. And lastly, it needs to be able to replicate uh, infinitely. Okay? So this, this actually provides a very important framework for thinking about cancer, for thinking about all these capabilities which then can be assembled in pretty much any order and with pretty much any combination of genes. And that's sort of the power of understanding both convergence and heterogeneity through this framework. Namely, the order in which those capabilities are acquired matters relatively little. And the specific gene uh, gain or gene loss mutations that arise in order to give each of these capabilities to cancer also matters very little, which basically means that every tumor can be completely unique, that every single person can have a completely different tumor, and yet all of these tumors have the same set of capabilities. Okay. Any questions so far? Yeah. It's a good question. So, if I have two reds, can I get away without a yellow? The answer is generally no, but you know, there's many ways of accomplishing yellow. And if they're not exactly yellow and they're a little purple or sorry, a little orange or something, it's still okay. In other words, you could get by with some alternatives for those, but I wouldn't say that you can get by without them complete. Because eventually in order to be a potent tumor, you need to sort of have all of that. But you can think, again, biologically, you know, even if you don't metastasize, you can still be a tumor, but you still will need to invade the tissue and so forth. Is everybody with me so far? So that was uh, in 2000, uh, in the first review. In 2011, this was updated with some emerging hallmarks uh, and some enabling characteristics. So the emerging hallmark were the deregulation of cellular energetics. Again, the tumor needs energy to survive, so it very often co-ops the energy producing machinery of the cell, such as mitochondria. It also needs to avoid immune destruction. And I think that will take us to the fourth uh, section of the, of the lecture of sort of how the tumor interacts with the immune environment. And in particular, what we're increasingly recognizing is that the tumor is actually actively reprogramming our immune cells in order to not attack it and to not recognize it. And then there's some uh, enabling characteristics, such as uh, the tumor-promoting inflammation, which is very uh, typically found. So again, this is kind of related to angiogenesis, of so sort of you know this influx of blood, but in this particular case, inflammation, and also uh, the gain of instability. And you can think of this. We're going to talk about mutator phenotypes throughout the lecture, but basically. This basically says, I'm going to play the numbers game. I'm going to uh, mess up my repair machinery so that my cells accumulate more and more mutations. How could that possibly be good? Well, if I'm a very rapidly dividing cell that now has many, many different options of gaining some of these 
uh, capabilities, then that, that's great because any one of my copies can gain it and then I can become an even more virulent uh, tumor. Does that make sense? Raise your hands if you're with me so far with these hallmarks, awesome. Who well, hears that they learned stuff already? Awesome, great. All right, so these are the sort of basic principles around which we can now start understanding tumor uh, biology. And, and through that, we'll see that the rest is basically fitting into this framework very nicely. And sort of, it, it, you know, this conceptual framework is very broad and it allows to really think about these capabilities uh, in, in, in you know, many different implementations. And in particular, how do we acquire these capabilities? Well, you could have germline mutations that either deactivate or overactivate a particular gene. And these germline mutations that I'm conceived with could be either common, namely it runs in the population, and this is a lot of what we found with GWAS. And if you looked at these uh, you know, GWAS um, plots that I showed you, uh, with thousands of these genetic variants colored according to the phenotype that they're associated with, there were really thousands of those associated with cancer. So there are many common variants that are associated with cancer. We very frequently think of cancer as this thing that you sequence, but in fact, there's a lot of genetic variants that are common in the population that are predisposing us to cancer with generally smaller effects. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Uh, common is defined as higher than 5% or maybe even higher than 1%, but they're, you know, they're out there. They have small effect sizes, but, you know, for the same oncogene or tumor suppressor, a non-coding variant that changes its expression by a little bit will have an impact on cancer for this position. Um, so these are common variants. You can have rare variants, so less than 1% that are sort of, you know, um, running within your family history. You could also have somatic mutations. These are mutations that happen after conception. So basically while your body uh, is sort of growing from the single cell through a series of divisions, there can be somatic mutations that can lead to cancer. And also gene regulatory alteration, okay? That, that sort of changes the expression of the genes. So cancer can be thought of as a combination of all of these types of mutations. So germline, somatic, epigenomic, and gene regulatory, which together basically act across one or multiple tissues to basically lead to this, um, to this capability. You should also recognize that these capabilities do not come in isolation. You don't just you know, roam the world of you know, this island that you've landed on and only pick up those things. As you go around, you pick up all kinds of other things. And these are passenger mutations. So uh, driver mutations are the one that confer the advantage to the growth of the tumor. And passenger mutations do not contribute to the fitness of the tumor. They're simply along for the ride. So as you go through these different stages of acquiring these mutations, you also gain many, many different, uh, you know, benign mutations. And eventually, you gain one of those mutator phenotypes, which basically leads to this genomic instability, which then allows uh, the accumulation of many, many more mutations. But again, the vast majority of those many, many more mutations will be passengers. Only a very small minority will be uh, drivers. And these mutations can be either that your, um, you know, your gas pedal in your car is broken or the brake is broken. So basically one of the two uh, could, could drive cancer. You can either have um, mutations that step on the gas pedal and get stuck or mutations that don't, you know, step on the brake. And in both cases, your car will be going crazy or your cell will be dividing super fast. Okay. So mutations that drive tumor genesis can fall in, in four classes. On one hand, you can have these oncogenes, which are basically driving cancer, so their activation is driving cancer. So these genes that are normally promoting and directing normal cell growth, but when mutated, they can become oncogenes and stimulate overactive cell growth. So that's when your gas pedal gets stuck, okay? Tumor suppressors is when your brake doesn't work anymore. So these are genes that normally function to slow cell division, and when mutated, they exhibit loss of function and allow for unchecked cell growth. Okay? You can also have mutations that increase the mutation rate. 
the vision of the mutator genes, which normally gener uh, regulate genome stability. And yeah, many of those will be detrimental to many, many cancer cells, but some of them will be beneficial to those cells. And also you should think about sort of what is this regulation good for? Basically, it's kind of like thinking about anarchy in a government. So basically, if you are the you know, a group of anarchists, then any kind of disruption is awesome. It doesn't matter. Yeah, sure, it's gonna hurt you, but it's gonna hurt the government a lot more, okay? And if you're a tumor cell, and you, you're sort of trying to move away from all these checks and controls that the rest of the body puts on individual cells to play nice and sort of be a part of the sort of society of your body, if you wish, those individual rogue cells um, will benefit a lot more from this regulation than the rest of the genome will. So yeah, they'll be like weird in all kinds of ways, but normal controlled environment is what the rest of the body wants and it's what sort of the non-tumor state wants. So basically mutator genes not only play the numbers game across different tumor cells that can then gain a capability when many other cells die, but even for an individual cell, being able to move away from stability is actually good for the tumor. Is everybody with me on that one? Awesome. And then in addition to mutator genes that basically cause mutations at the DNA level, like you know, getting rid of DNA repair and getting re, you know getting a lot of rearrangements, etc., you can also have epimutator genes. So these are genes whose mutation or dysregulation leads to drastic gene regulatory changes. Again, in the same concept of going away from stability is great for the tumor. Uh, <clears throat> going away from stability can basically trigger the expression of all kinds of genes that uh, lead to pluripotency or to cell growth or sort of cell divisions and so on and so forth. And basically, very often, you will notice that the genes that lead to cancer are these master regulatory genes that have thousands of targets across the genome. And you're like, how can it be? How can the cancer be selecting for this gene that will clearly dysregulate a thousand targets? How can that lead to such a specific thing as cancer? And the answer is that cancer it has, has many paths to it, and dysregulation in general helps explore many, many of these paths. Um, and, you know, in general, the definition of life is basically pretty much trying to make more of yourself. And it takes a lot of energy and effort to maintain ourselves from this very simple, you know, basic. Uh, primordial tendency to just divide uh, that, that sort of many bacteria have and serve them very well. Um, and, and sort of many of these epimutators are basically dysregulatory that sort of take you back to this primitive state of, I just want to take over. Everybody with me? Awesome. So here's some examples. So P53 is, um, you know, basically defined based on its weight. Uh, it's a big protein and it serves as a tumor suppressor that's normally, um, that's commonly known as the guardian of the genome. So it basically serves as a key link between DNA damage and repair slash apoptosis. So mutations in P53 can cause loss of function and therefore the checks and balances into the cell cycle, making sure that the DNA is intact, making sure that you stop the cell cycle if there's something wrong with your chromosomes uh, and leads to apoptosis, this is now gone. So P53 is basically not doing its job as the guardian of the genome, and it just lets the cell divide, even though the cell is like freaky looking. And that cell can now sort of gain a lot of additional mutations and become ultimately cancerous. So P53 is integrating signals from many different places in terms of if there's DNA breaks or UV radiation stress or all kinds of other oncogenes. And then it controls mitochondrial processes, growth suppressors, DNA repair, growth arrest, apoptosis, prevention of radiogenesis, et cetera. So, when P53, so, so therefore, it is very common uh, to, for a tumor to have acquired a mutation in P53 that deactivates it and therefore paves the path to gain many of, more of those mutations. Everybody with me so far? So the converse is RAS family members, which are proto-oncogenes. So again, these are the gas, the gas pedals when P53 is the brake. 
So RAS family members are small GTPases that are involved in cell growth and cell cycle pathways. And mutations in RAS family members can cause rampant growth and proliferation. Again, they sit here as master regulators of a lot of these sort of cell cycle drivers. And when mutated, can become overactive and therefore lead to uh, rampant growth. Okay? You can also have uh, oncogenes be created not from one gene, but from a combination of two genes. For example, you could have the beginning of one gene and the end of another gene. You could have the DNA binding domain of one gene and the activator domain of another gene, the regulatory circuitry of one gene and the you know, protein coding section of another gene and so on and so forth. So you could have tumors that are driven by recurrent fusion events that create chimeric proteins and then serve as oncogenes. So a famous example is this uh, BRCA-ABL uh, fusion that basically drives CML, the chronic myelogenous leukemia, which is sort of recurrently found as an easy combination to make by making a rearrangement between two chromosomes. Okay? So a common therapeutic hypothesis is that once the tumor acquires these capabilities, these talisman, these, you know, um, specific tools that it needs to become a tumor, it then gets addicted to those capabilities. In other words, once, once the tumor has now gained this little you know, green thing, it then builds all kinds of stuff assuming that it has the green thing. And therefore, if you take the green thing away, you might be able to fight the tumor when in fact a normal cell would not be as dependent on that green thing. Raise your hands if you're with me on this concept. Awesome. So that's the concept of the Achilles heel of the tumor, that the tumor has now become addicted to this oncogene, that it sort of requires and relies on this oncogene. Even though it has many both genetic and epigenetic alteration, it kind of depends on this talisman that it, that it got early on. And targeting these capabilities could then provide an Achilles heel for cancer and enable targeted therapeutics. You can basically say, okay, Every one of these tumor cells that I've now sequenced has the same thing. Let's now target that thing and see if, you know, if the cancer will succumb to that approach. So combination treatment can basically also be used to create these addictions. Even if the tumor is not dependent on that, you could somehow target it with uh, another treatment that will then push it into this narrow evolutionary space which then makes it addicted to like the, the little green capability. And then sort of once you've pushed it into that space, evolutionarily, the other tumors are gonna be less fit and therefore that lineage of the tumor will survive. And then you can go and hammer it onto that lineage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So basically, there's, it's a very, very good point. So basically, there's multiple ways to target those. You could basically say, I am assuming that I'm now targeting the wild type version of this, or I'm assuming I'm now targeting the mutated version of this. Most of the time, you don't have the luxury of building a sort of tumor specific therapeutic. So I agree with you that most of the time it's going to be the wild type version. But as you, as you'll see later in the lecture, there are ways of sort of going after specific capabilities of the tumor in their mutated state. Any other questions? All right, so basically again, uh, the, the concept is that a normal cell will not care as much about B, but the tumor cell will care a lot more about B, so then disrupting B can have a greater impact on the tumor cell. I spoke a lot about mutator genes. These are master mutational switches. Basically, some mutations can lead to lower repair efficiency and increase the overall mutation rate. And these mutator genes are usually involved in DNA repair pathways, genes that control chromatin stability, and also movement of chromosomes during the end phase of the cell cycle. So, you know, there, these genes serve to arrest the cell cycle and basically tell the cells stop dividing unless all of these checkpoints are met and then the um, mutator genes can somehow tolerate this progression even despite these mutations. Um, and therefore, these mutations can accumulate. 
And again, we talked a lot about sort of single gene at a time, but there's a lot of multi-gene effects. For example, you could have a copy number variant that sort of increases the expression or the copy number of four genes in a row. Or you could have a rearrangement that now brings a very strong activating element in the context of multiple genes, which are then overactivated. So basically tumors very often exhibit many signatures of genomic instability, polyploidy, unemployity, chromosomal duplications, and these can basically affect many genes at a time. So these can lead to dosage effects and also structural variants and sort of a gene moving now into a new context which is very active or a regulatory element moving into a context where it turns its neighbor to be very active. Everybody with me so far? So this is the lay of the land. These are the hallmarks of cancer, uh, the concept of tumor suppressors, proto-oncogenes, which then become oncogenes when mutated, and then the mutator phenotype, where you've disrupted the repair machinery and sort of causing havoc in the genome, much of which will then lead away from stability and towards the cancer states. And some of this havoc is actually sometimes launched by oncoviruses. This is a viral infection, which all it tries to do is insert a copy of the virus inside your genome. But if it inserts in the wrong place, it might disrupt the DNA repair machinery. And you're like, oops, I didn't mean to give you cancer. I just wanted to sort of give you an infection. But it turns out that you can have such, uh, you know, such a tumor actually arise from uh, these viruses. And we also talked about fusion oncogen. Everybody with me so far? Who feels like you're learning stuff? Yeah, good. All right, so now let's look at how do we, uh, yeah. What makes a good virus is usually the ability to not kill the host. So the best viruses are the ones that somehow hold back. They have a long incubation period. You know, you're spread a lot before you kill the host. And then, sure, the host can die. I don't care because I've now made many copies of myself. But um, I, don't, I, I can't think of an evolutionary advantage to the virus of the host actually dying from cancer. But if you can, that'd be great. Well, I think the... Uh, Homo like, Yeah, but the virus also needs to spread from person to person because after that person is, you know... Sure, you can take over the, the host very rapidly, but the goal of the virus is to make more of itself and spread. I mean, not the goal, but obviously the evolutionary advantage. Yeah? Yeah. Again, you guys are thinking like a virus, like a host, like a cancer. Great. Arms race. Um, all right, everybody with me? So now let's see what are the lessons that we're learning from actually profiling these tumors. And the, the key lessons are going to be recurrence and heterogeneity. We're going to talk about before next generation sequencing and then recurrence and also evolutionary uh, dynamics. So these hallmarks of cancer that I'm talking about didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, you know, um, Bob didn't show up with a bunch of tablets from the mountain saying, hey, here's a hallmark. They came from big data analysis, from basically sequencing tumors and basically recognizing these mutations handed to cluster in a small number of pathways. Okay, so how did that happen? Well, the first tool has been exome and more recently whole genome profiling. And that's how you can identify driver mutations, which basically give a positive fitness benefit to the tumor. These mutations can be common, rare, or somatic. And this is how these hallmarks of cancer uh, were discovered in the first place. And then the three types of mutations, as I mentioned earlier, uh, require three different types of analysis. Common variants, rare variants, and somatic variants. The common variants, we carry GWAS, the Genome-Wide Association Study. We're basically looking at the frequency of common alleles in cancer uh, versus non-cancer uh, individuals. And uh, these are typically weak effect, non-coding mutations, which are very common in the population. For rare variants, that's where genetic analysis, uh, the genetic linkage analysis comes in. And these are typically strong effect Mendelian mutations in families. 
And then for the rest, namely somatic mutations, you basically typically carry out exome or whole genome sequencing. And these are strong effect somatic mutations that arise during mitotic cell division. Okay? So the idea is that having these ancient, very common or recent rare mutations can then lead to a predisposition even before you're born. Cancer runs in your family. Okay. Uh, this is typically the runs in your family and this, you know, runs in your population. Then the egg is fertilized and you basically have mutations as you keep growing and dividing. You have all kinds of passenger mutations. These don't matter. And then you gain some initiating driver event, another driver event, another driver event. Maybe these are the sort of capabilities that the cancer is now gaining. And then you basically have, of course, additional passengers all along the way. And then you have the last clonal driver e event. This is clonal as in everyone has it. So clone means, uh, <laughs> actually comes from branch in Greek, uh, but it means that, and, and sort of cloning is sort of making a genetic copy of something. So all of these uh, have exactly the same mutation. So all of these are tumor cells and these share this common driver element. And then you have additional driver element that can make some you know, tumor cells more virulent than others or some less virulent than others. Okay? So this is the progression of, uh, of these events through this combination of GWAS out here, genetic linkage out here, and then sequencing for the rest of it. Everybody with me? So GWAS, again, there are dozens uh, or actually hundreds of these genetic variants that are associated with cancer and they're associated with different types of tumors. So more than 400 different GWAS hits uh, are associated with diverse cancer types. And these are, as I mentioned earlier, polygenic, weak, and no visible Mendelian uh, inheritance. On top of that, you lay out the rare variants. Again, these run in the family. Basically, you know, your grandmother, your mother, and you know, uh, other ancestors had breast cancer, well, you better go get tested because chances are that you have, you know, there's a, there's a big chance that you have one of those mutations that, that, you know, not one of those mutations, but you have the mutation. So the idea here is that these are, uh, you know, sort of predisposing you to more DNA damage or more mutations and so on and so forth. And then, um, you know, that can lead to, so for example, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are, you know, a huge risk factor. And if you're, you know, mother or grandmother had it, well, you better go get tested. So th this, is, this is down here. And these were basically initially found by carrying out Mendelian analysis in families and basically saying which version of uh, this gene, which allele was inherited by the family members that had cancer. And then that allowed the genetic pinpointing to this region of the genome. And then thousands of different families were all mapping to the same location. That's exactly how the BRCA genes were discovered. Because even though the mutation was new and unique in each family, it was the same genes that were recurrently mutated. Everybody with me here? So again, having a family history, building pedigrees, you can map cancer driver genes with linkage analysis. And then that's how Mary Claire King mapped BRCA1 or chromosome 17 to 21 in 1990 using genetic linkage analysis in families with an inherited risk for breast cancer. And every family carried a different set of inherited mutations. And that's sort of the concept of recurrence. So you basically have both heterogeneity, which basically means that every family has a different mutation, but recurrence, which basically means that they all converge into the same set of genes. Okay? And then layered on top of that, basically on top of the common and the rare, you basically have all of the somatic. You can't think of them in isolation. You have to think of them in context. And again, going back to these hallmarks, some of these might already be running in your family. So this one might be a common variant in, I don't know, the Greek population. This one might be a rare variant in my particular history. And the rest of them I might acquire as I'm, you know, a fertilized egg that's dividing. Everybody with me? So now layering on top of common and rare, you basically have these, muta these somatic mutations. So how do you discover those? By exome sequencing. You basically can do paired sequencing 
of normal and tumor tissue. So from the same individual, you go in, you take a tumor sample, and as you go in, you basically also get some healthy tissue nearby. And you basically ask, what are the mutations that are unique to the tumor, but not shared with the normal, okay? And that basically tells you about somatic alterations. And these are very frequently recurrent. These are very frequently recurrent in the same small number of hotspots that are implicated in cancer. And then clonal heterogeneity means that, you know, there's a lot of mutational diversity even within the tumor. And that can actually lead to lower allelic fractions where only a small fraction of the sequencing reads actually show the mutations. Uh, so you need very highly sensitive methods to be able to call these mutations. Because again, this is not something where I'm looking for a you know, variant that all of your cells have. If only 5% of your cells have it, then I have to have the ability to not just simply treat it as a sequencing error because 95% of the cells don't have it. Everybody with me on this one? Awesome. So that's where some of these technologies come in, where you basically have some statistic that basically tells you how likely is it that this is actually a true variant, that it's found in you know, maybe 20% or 30% of the tumor cells, but in 0% of the normal cells. Is that enough of a signal that I can now make a statistical argument that this is non-random? And then you can basically filter these based on whether there's a you know, gap nearby whether there's a bias in the strand, which could suggest that this is a sequencing technology artifact. Namely, if only the forward reads, but not the reverse reads are showing the mutation, that could just be a common technological problem with that sequencing technology. Or if it's poorly mapping, if you know, this mutation is happening in a region that has a bunch of other polymorphisms as well, then chances are that this is just a mark mapping artifact. Or if you have multiple alleles uh, beyond two, or if that position is very highly clustered, or whether it's also observed in the control. Then you can basically sort of use all those to filter out false positives. And then the last test is, do I find it in a bunch of different individuals? Do, do I find that this gene is now recurrently mutated across different people? And uh, is it already a common variant in uh, dbSNP, in the database of all single nucleotide polymorphisms? Or uh, is it a newly observed one? Because chances are, given how rare it is to ha basically to have the same mutation arise in multiple individual people, if I find in the DBSNP, I can just throw it away. It basically means that it's most likely a common variant. Okay? So for example, Mutect is a Bayesian classifier that determines if the mutation is tumor specific using paired tumor normal sequencing, even if the allelic fraction in the tumor is less than 10%, which is quite remarkable. Everybody with me here? All right, and then that's detecting the mutations. And once you've detected the mutations, you wanna build a database that basically says, hey, here are all of the genes that have, you know, many of those mutations. So the somatic mutations from mutech need to be annotated. And sort of there are tools such as Oncotator that basically annotates uh, this using info from all kinds of databases. So for example, from GenCode, it can decide whether it's a genic or non-genic, if it's a coding or non-coding mutation. If it's inside a protein, you can basically decide, you know, how much the effect is on that protein. For cancer variants specifically, there's a lot of mutation databases that basically tell you here are the common genes and common mutations associated with cancer. And also, you want to look in non-cancer databases to basically say, hey, this is just another common mutation that I expect to see in the population. Everybody with me so far? Awesome. So again, this is the way that these cancer driver genes are identified in the first place. So basically the way that we get these hallmarks is through cancer drivers and the way we get these cancer drivers is through recurrent mutations. The fact that in different families, the same gene is targeted over and over again. Again, uh, BRCA1 on chromosome 17 has more than 500 different mutations that are reported. BRCA2 has more than 300 different mutations that are reported. And these are recurrent sometimes at the nucleotide level where the same amino acid will sort of cause these genes to malfunction. And therefore the same mutation when it arises is leading to cancer and therefore it will arise in multiple individuals de novo. You could have recurrence at the gene level where multiple deactivations of the same gene 
or recurrence at the pathway level where multiple genes are, are recurrent to mutate. Yeah, yeah, so, so here you're throwing away common variants that you have previously seen in a SNP, in a, in a SNP database, in, you know, a TB SNP. But here you're actually keeping mutations that are found in multiple cancer patients. You're throwing away if they're found in non-cancer patients. Exactly, so basically um, you can have recurrence even at the SNP level because of the amino acid selection. And again, there's only so many amino acids to be mutated. If you have the more of the population you're sampling, the more chances you have that some people have by chance get the same mutation. But this is by no means a SNP. This is just a recurrent somatic alteration. Because if it was an inherited variant, it would be, you know, so, um, sorry, there's two ways to get there. One is an uh, inherited variant in your family, but not a common variant. And the other one is a somatic mutation. Chances are that common variants are not going to have this because it would be so prevalent that you know, it would be selected. Was there another question? Everybody with me? Awesome. So um, these large-scale exome analysis have now revealed these recurrent mutated genomic hotspots. So basically, if you ask across many, many different cancers, you basically find that, you know, P53, for example, is by far the most abundantly mutated one. Basically, uh, you know, and then if you go down the list in sort of decreasing frequency, and many of them are in fact uh, occurring in small number, relatively small number of hotspots. Basically, there's more than 20,000 different, or nearly 20,000 uh, different hotspots, which are, um, uh, you know, sort of recurrently hitting a small number of protein coding genes. So this is what people refer to usually as a panel. So basically, you have your cancer panel, and you go after all these genes each time. Instead of basically resequence the whole genome, you could basically say, well, I've done thousands of studies, and you know, 11,000 tumors across 41 tumor types, two million somatic mutations, and then even though this could be spread uniformly across the genome at random, they in fact converge into a small number of hotspots. So I can now basically go in a new individual and say, well, instead of sequencing completely de novo in a therapeutic setting or in a diagnostic setting, I'm going to go specifically after those genes. This is not a discovery setting. I don't care to find new mutations anymore. I just want to know whether this person has a predisposition. And then you go after those panel sequences. Everybody with me here? Awesome. So again, we talked about these two sides of cancer, recurrence versus heterogeneity. Recurrence means that there's a small set of pathway alterations that are necessary for cancer. That's what led to the hallmarks idea. And then oncogenes and tumor suppressors serve as those points of recurrence. But cancer is an evolutionary process driven by positive selection. There's a very large number of precancer cells which are constantly subjected to selection. And there's many, many different ways that a particular oncogenic pathway can be hit. So that leads to heterogeneity, okay? So we can now look more deeply into these clonal evolutionary processes. As I mentioned earlier, you have to think of cancer as starting from a background of predisposition with common variants and then rare variants inside your family uh, lineage, and then eventually a series of somatic alterations that lead to cancer. So you, you basically have multiple forces acting. On one hand, you have intratumor heterogeneity, which is driven by the evolutionary dynamics of the tumor. You also have positive selection acting for mutations with a fitness benefit to the cancer, obviously not to the person. And then this depends on the mutation rate, the number of cell divisions, and the cancer type. This mutator phenotype can lead to genomic instability, which can then be a source of functional heterogeneity. You can basically have some inherited or somatic abnormalities, which then leads to instability, which then leads to more mutations, which then leads to increased genetic diversity, and then leads to increased heterogeneity. And this instability can be detrimental to individual tumor cells, but also help escape bottlenecks by increasing the number of paths to cancer. 
So as you're treating cancer, you will basically see that the new tumors have now accumulated two or three mutations. This is basically because mutations happen at random, but as the tumor is being selected for, these mutations can sometimes add up to each other. And that can basically lead to either emergence to, to, to re resistance or um, you know, resistance to uh, this chemotherapy. Uh, so, and, and then again, the tumors play the numbers game, as I mentioned, because they have very little purifying selection. They don't, you know, they don't care. They can just die off as long as one of them survives and then gets to expand. Okay, everybody with me? So the more diversity you have here, the more paths to escape you have. And since you're now able to divide, you can just expand out. So heterogeneity basically drives cancer emergence, but it also drives resistance to therapeutics. So some of the clones will survive the therapy and then later result in relapse. So you can have this initial picture, uh, which basically has some probability of recurrence, but then you have that subjected to uh, you know, particular treatments. So basically here, the tumor was expanding. You now have a treatment. The tumor is contracting, except for some cells that have now gained an additional mutation and escaped therapy. And then you now have a second treatment, perhaps, that will control the rest of the cells. But now you have another escape event from another one. And then metastasis. So you can use now sequencing to trace the clonal history of different metastatic sites. You basically ask, you know, if I take samples from multiple places in the same individual, can I actually trace the history of their relationship? You could basically ask, well, how many of them are ubiquitous, where these points are appearing across, you know, multiple different sites? How many of them are shared in the primary? And how many of them are shared in the metastasis? Which basically suggests that there was this set of driver events that then led to that metastasis and how many of them are private to a particular tumor. And these are the ones in gray here. Everybody with me here? <coughs> so you could basically find that the mutations are in fact regionally distributed between the different metastatic sites. And uh, you, know, you can then use that to partition them into uh, different classes. So you can basically build computational models for understanding clonal substructure. You basically uh, need to recognize that clonal substructure in order to distinguish driver from passenger events. And you can basically have multiple measurements across time and across space. Uh, and the more prevalent the mutation, the more uh, power you will have to infer its phylogenetic history. And you can sort of use that as a way to train uh, models that basically tell you, well, this is the most likely path to have led to the set of uh, events that I'm looking at. You can also look at the uh, path to uh, resistance. And uh, in, in this particular case, uh, this is our own collaboration with Dr. Geneviève Bolland over at MGH, where one patient was treated for you know, almost three years with uh, different tumors arising across his body. You can basically see here, you know, the large number of uh, tumor events. And uh, Geneviève basically went and gathered biopsies from all these different tumor sites, enabling us to now build a phylogeny that basically tell us how are all of these different samples related to each other. And you can basically see sort of these are happening all over his body. You can see sort of in the neck, in the face, in the leg, in the you know, arm, and so, and so forth. And you can basically find that at least five different lineages appear to be coexisting inside the same patient. And you can use that to now understand what are the mutational events that drive each of these lineages. And in fact, you can find recurrent events across different lineages that are actually happening independently of each other. And recurrence is in fact happening even within the same uh, patient. Basically, the C2 mutation was in fact found in multiple independent lineages, so here and also here, where you know, this particular tumor appears to benefit from having that mutation. And you can sort of see that because of this independence. Everybody with me? All right, so this is exome sequencing, basically understanding recurrence, understanding these 
common signatures across uh, different tumor types, different patients, different tumors, and different clones within the same person, understanding the evolutionary dynamics of clonal heterogeneity, and also building these computational models for dealing with recurrence and heterogeneity. Let's now go beyond mutations to basically see what are sources of these uh, reprogramming that do not require a particular mutation. So, um, Oh, we're not there yet. I'm sorry. We're still here. Gosh, I'm running late. Um, so basically, let's go beyond the protein coding mutations to now look for non-coding uh, drivers. And that's sort of, again, looking across uh, the genome for conversion. So basically, looking outside proteins, you can basically carry out whole genome sequencing now for about a thousand dollars per person. This is just for, you know, uh, germline mutations. If you're looking for whole genome sequencing of tumors, you need to go to 30x or a lot more, basically truly recognize even lower frequency events and then compare them to uh, non-tumor tissues from the same patient. And that, you know, what, you, what you're recognizing when you do that is that the vast majority, vast, vast majority of somatic mutations are in fact non-coding, exactly as you would expect. Mutations are happening everywhere in the genome. And the vast, vast majority of them are in fact passenger mutations. How do you find the drivers? How can you make sense of these non-coding mutations? Well, we can use the same principles of recurrence and convergence. So for recurrence, this is similar to coding, but the challenge here is that when we have a protein coding gene, the recurrence is easy because I know exactly what the exons are. If it happens within the same exons of the same gene, I'm putting a bucket around an entity, which is a gene, and I know exactly what mutation is perturbing that gene. But for non-coding mutations, it's much harder to put a bucket around all of the enhancers that are linked to the same gene. We generally have some ambiguity about what are the convergence properties of these non-coding regions. So basically when you're asking for recurrence, the boundaries of these elements are not known. The background mutation rates vary greatly. And then when you're asking for convergence, these mutations that can be scattered across a million nucleotides might all be targeting the same gene. They don't have to be in the gene body. They, have, they don't have to be even on the exons anymore. They could just be anywhere. So basically, both of them are much harder. And basically, in order to recognize these drivers, you need both to know what is the right bucket to put things in, namely, how do I group mutations across the genome together? How do I prioritize the severity of a particular mutation? Namely, in a protein coding region, I know that this is an amino acid changing mutation. So I will give it a higher likelihood than a synonymous mutation in the same gene. So I know how to prioritize the severity of these mutations in protein coding, but in non-coding, I don't actually know how to do that. So I need to sort of bring in everything we've learned about gene regulation, about linking, about sort of all these circuits to the service of uh, understanding these non-coding mutations. So on one hand, detecting the mutations, basically counting events relative to the background. And this is very similar to the exons, but much harder because there's a lot more space and we understand the mutation process a lot less. And then number two, how do we functionally prioritize the mutations by understanding what are the underlying sequence changes that will have the most impact? And then lastly, experimental validation can help by putting these mutations either in a humanized mouse or some other model that allows us to test their ability to drive cancer. Everybody with me here? So there's many, many things that you need to correct for, okay, in order to find these non-coding drivers. The first thing to correct for is how mutable or mutating are different tumor types. You can basically see here the mutational frequency across many samples of uh, rhabdoid tumor, Ewing sarcoma, thyroid, AML, and so on and so forth. And you can see that within each group, there's a lot of diversity between the different individuals that have that tumor. But across these different groups, there's dramatic differences in the uh, mutability, in the background mutation rate. So for example, here, if you look at melanoma, its average mutation rate is a hundredfold higher than the rate for uh, rhabdoid tumor mutation. Okay? So the background mutation rates can vary greatly, greatly 
you know, by a factor of 100. And the specific types of mutations can vary greatly. So here, I'm not only showing you the uh, total number of mutations, but also whether these mutations were a CTT mutation in yellow, or a C2A mutation in blue, or a C2G mutation in red, okay? So both the number and the particular patterns of mutations are in fact uh, varying greatly, okay? Why is that? Because depending on the particular genes that are responsible for the repair of different issues, Mutating these genes will basically lead to a particular mutational signature in pancreas that is distinct from breast and so forth, okay? So uh, if a different set of regulators are responsible for either repair or detection of mutations and so on and so forth, then disrupting different issues will basically disrupt different, um, will, will lead to different mutational signatures. Raise your hands if you're with me on this one, awesome. So that's the first one, basically looking at the overall background mutation rate. The second one is these mutational profiles, as I mentioned, where basically depending on the type of cancer that you are, you find very different types of mutations. So basically, these reflect differences in both of the mutator genes, but also the repair genes, uh, which are most active in each tissue. So you can see here the you know, different tumor types have very, very different uh, you know, mutations. Okay. Everybody with me on this one? The third one is as you go across the genome, the regional mutation rate varies greatly. So if you walk along chromosome 14, you see that you know, the mutation rate is very high and then very low and then very high and very low and so on and so forth. Okay? So correcting for that background mutation rate is extremely important. Uh, it correlates with replication timing in blue and also with gene expression level in green. So the more genes are expressed, uh, the less replication it has, and the early versus late replication, again, correlates with high or low mutation. So initially, when people were basically sequencing cancers, they were not correcting for this background mutation rate. And they found that there's a large number of olfactory receptors that were suddenly can candidate for cancer driver genes because they, they had huge number of mutations. But when you correct it for what is the overall rate of mutation that I find in the normal human population outside tumor cells, they were also the most heavily mutated in non-tumor. And taking the ratio, suddenly they disappeared into the background rate, okay? That's why it's extremely important to sort of correct for that background rate. Because olfactory receptors, for example, you know, show a very strong uh, background mutational frequency. And the reason for that is that they're not under a lot of selection. If you, if you can smell, you're still okay. All right. The third one is DNA accessibility. The more accessible a particular region is, the more the repair machinery can access it, and the more it will be able to correct the mutation. Okay? So the repair machinery is optimized for accessible sites, which would otherwise become hypermutated due to accessibility. But in cancer, the repair machinery is often disrupted, so the cancer mutations are actually enriched for DNA hypersensitive sites. And these are very cancer type specific, and these are likely due to promoter activity and uh, excision repair. The third one is if you look at how DNA is packaged in those nucleosomes, mutations are actually very uh, correlated with where the DNA strand that carries that particular nucleotide sits in these uh, 147 base pairs that are wrapped around the eight histone proteins that form a nucleus. So basically, the, you know, there's a 10 base pair periodicity, and this periodicity tracks the DNA minor group facing toward and away from the histones, and the orientation of the periodicity depends on the mutational processes that are active in that particular tissue, and that has, in fact, contributed to this ATCG 10 base pair periodicity that you find in eukaryotic genomes. The mutation also greatly varies by chromatin state. Even if you look in you know, the same level of accessibility, whether you're a transcribed state, a regulatory state, enhancer, repress, promoter, or poi state, you basically have a different expected average uh, rate of mutation. So uh, this is uh, work by um, 
Richard Salari in, in my group, who basically looked at a large number of prostate samples, 55 prostate samples, and then he found that there was this dramatic correlation with the chromatin state that you were in. Uh, he also found this dramatic uh, diversity in mutation rate across patients. So for the same chromatin state across different patients in rows here, you basically had, yes, the same states were more highly mutated or less highly mutated uh, in each person, but for different people, everything was shifted uh, systematically to more or fewer mutations. Everybody with me here? You need to correct for all of that, and there are tools out there that try to do that. So, for example, MutigDB accounts for many covariates, including patient-specific effects, gene-specific effects, conservation, how these mutation rates correlate with whether evolutionary conservation of that region is high or low, transcriptional activity, DNA replication, uh, uh, timing, and chromatin state to build a background model and then call significant somatic mutations above and beyond what you would expect from that background model. Everybody with me? We then aggregate these scores across the tumor and establish a significant threshold to control for FDR, and that's what leads to these uh, tumor uh, predictions. And specifically for non-coding drivers, basically you need to account for additional details, such as you know the background mutation frequency, the chromatin state, and so on and so forth. NCD Detect is one of those uh, tools. So how do those non-coding mutations act? Well, in every possible and imaginable way. So they could be leading to a motif gain or to a motif loss. They could be changing the DNA binding domain of a transcription factor. They could be rewiring uh, the regulatory circuitry of a particular region. They could be acting at the microRNA level by either disrupting or creating a microRNA binding site. They could also be uh, having a sponge effect whereby many of these microRNAs will now be going to the wrong target, effectively freeing your gene from being targeted and repressed. Yeah. I would expect so, but I don't remember any particular paper, but my guess is that yes, because it's a, it's a very easy way to sort of dysregulate a bunch of genes. Any other questions? <clears throat> Basically, what we're finding is that there's ways that all of these non-coding mutations can be converging onto the same target gene. Again, uh, work by Richard Salari, we're basically now looking at this regulatory plexus model, where for every gene, we're basically building the set of all enhancer regions that are showing high C links to that target gene, even across chromosomes in some cases. And what we're finding is that this allows you to capture recurrent mutations, even when the mutations individually are distinct between individuals, but across individuals, they are recurrently targeting the same uh, target gene. And you can use that to basically predict target genes that are consistently dysregulated. And indeed, you can experimentally validate that these are uh, non-coding drivers by basically testing these genes and then showing that their perturbation can then lead to cancer or uh, tumor suppression. So that's all for uh, both protein coding and non-coding drivers. But going beyond these mutational drivers, we can now start looking at epigenomic uh, drivers. So if you look at uh, you know serous ovarian cancer, what you can basically see is that the you know many of these mutations are happening in uh, uh, you know, the same set of genes, but also that epigenomic alterations are leading to changes in those genes. So even without mutating the DNA itself, you might have a loss of, you know, its histone modifications or its accessibility and so on and so forth. So these can be uh, th thought of as uh, not mutators, but epimutators. These are genes that can control the epigenome maintenance uh, or wiring. So, if you have a mutation in a mutator gene, you basically have more um, uh, somatic alteration. If you instead have a mutation in epimutator gene, you then have more epigenomic dysregulation. So the idea here is that you have these global epigenome-wide changes, 
by ex which are very often exploited in cancer based on you know uh, either mutations in the polycom repressor uh, complex or in DNA methylases or demethylases, methyl transferases in general, that are basically uh, then uh, causing this global dysregulation, which is very often exploited by cancer. Uh, so some recurrent features are, uh, for example, for activation, you could have a loss of DNA methylation across hundreds of genes. Uh, for repression, you can have a gain of DNA methylation in promoter regions. You could have a gain of repressive histone modifications. You could have state changes where you're changing the set of genomic uh, remodeling factors or the nucleus and positioning and so on and so forth. And you can basically detect epigenomic drivers by exome sequencing, by finding that recurrent mutations very often appear to be targeting a small number of epigenetic modifiers. Uh, and then the set of epigenomic modifiers, in fact, varies by cancer type. So you could basically start diagnosing cancer as altered differentiation. And I mentioned that earlier, that basically we have embryonic stem cells that are, you know, dividing wildly, and then these differentiate, and eventually they become, you know, non-dividing cells. But cancer somehow is able to overcome this and effectively go back into a pluripotent state or a totipotent state where these cells are continuing to proliferate and also can differentiate into different, uh, different phases. So you can basically treat these dysregulations by reprogramming cancer cells towards normal development. You can basically say, well, I'm gonna bring you back to that previous state and I'm not gonna bring you forward to a new repressed state, which is not sort of so prol proliferative. Is everybody with me on this one? And then you can start understanding that functional heterogeneity at the single cell level now. So basically with single cell RNA-seq, you can capture the diversity of clonal groups and the, you know, recognize these expression differences that are sometimes clustered along uh, the DNA. You can also find additional diversity beyond these genomic alterations and then understand stochastic variation within each of the different states of the, of the tumor. And then lastly, we're not able to only sequence the tumor itself to understand the diversity at the single cell level of the tumor cells, but you can also sequence the tumor immune microenvironment. You can basically say, what are the immune cell differences across the sort of surrounding cells of the tumor? And that allows you to sort of recognize, um, you know, immune cells and stromal cells that are altered in addition to the tumor itself. Is everybody with me on this one? And that also can reveal heterogeneity in the cell cycle state, stage and also in the cellular state. So basically depending on where cells are in the cell cycle, you can kind of see that in the, what? I don't like you. This is great. Um, Everybody with me on this? Great. Um, and then what's really cool is that by having the single cell technology that I mentioned uh, last week, that allow you to profile both the DNA and the RNA from the same exact cell, you can now start matching the two and basically say, what is the specific sequence alteration in the DNA that led to a specific dysregulation in the RNA of the same cell? Everybody with me on this? Great. So we talked about the basis of cancer. We talked about lessons from exome, from whole genome, and going beyond mutations. For the rest of the lecture, I'd like to talk about uh, the relationship between the tumor and the immune cells that surround it. So the tumor is both dependent on and acting on its microenvironment. So there's a lot of interactions between the cancer cells, the cancer stem cells, the immune cells surrounding this, the invasive cancer cells, and then additional sort of tumor surrounding cells. And all of these together form what we call the microenvironment of the tumor. The tumor doesn't exist in isolation. It exists in the context of their microenvironment. Every tumor has a variety of cells in the microenvironment, 
that provide key interactions that can either repress its growth or promote it. Okay. So basically have a lot of uh, interactions between the tumor cell and the extracellular matrix, endothelial cells, tumor promoting inflammatory cells, cancer associated fibroblasts, and so on and so forth. Okay. So there's a lot of pathways of communication and interaction and you know, inter-influence uh, of these tumor cells with um, the surrounding environment. So <clears throat> the tumor is actually immuno-editing. It is actually rewiring its own immuno profile, immune profile. So very early in the tumor emergence, the tumor is able to, ev to evade the adaptive immune system by altering its own immune profile. So this is simply Darwinian evolution. There's positive selection for tumor cells that go unrecognized. How is that possible? There's many ways that tumors repress their recognition by the immune system. One of them is they lower their antigenic profile by, favorite, by favoring less antigenic mutation. Again, this is selection at work. You're not actively thinking that, obviously. Uh, so that basically means that as the tumor has mutations that are easily recognized by the immune system, the immune system will detect that tumor and will kill that tumor. But then some of those mutations, the immune system can't catch everything. So some of those mutations will basically evade detection and those are the tumor cells that will be kept, okay? So over time, you basically end up with tumor cells that have uh, subsisted are the ones that have a lower uh, antigenic profile. Everybody with me on this one? Raise your hands if you have any questions. Questions? No, okay, good. So the second one is in terms of antigen presentation. So when cells interact with each other, they're constantly saying, hey, I'm a cell from a nolis and I'm a liver cell and here's my major compatibility complex, here's my ID and so forth. So the tumor basically says, oh, no ID, sorry. And it, it basically hides this very complex, this histopathy complex that enables uh, cells to, to recognize each other. It also establishes an immunosuppressive microenvironment surrounding the tumor. So it basically expresses uh, signals that tell the immune cells, oh, relax, everything's going great, and sort of actually suppress these immune cells. They downregulate cytokine signaling, which basically then represses the cell activity and reprograms, and they reprogram T regulatory cells, which are inhibitory cells and adretic cells, to basically tell other immune cells, relax, everything's going fine. They direct repression of T cell effectors by upregulating T cell inhibitory ligands. They recruit suppressive immune cell types. They recruit immunosuppressive myeloid derived suppressor cells, MDSCs and that allows them to escape immune surveillance. You basically have this interaction between the you know, tumor cell, which is initially transformed, which can be you know, either eliminated or reach some kind of escape, and then that escape is um, facilitated by this interaction with the environment. Raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome. So you can basically have uh, many ways that this tumor immune interaction happens during uh, cancer progression, during therapy, and also during relapse. You basically have you know, tumor cells that are interacting with the T cells and you know, are actively working to suppress them by basically sending them these signals. You can have new coding mutations, which basically generate new opportunities for the immune system to detect the tumor through new antigens. So the immune system can now recognize the tumor as non-cell and then target it. The tumors also downregulate their own antigen presentation by downregulating the major histocompatibility complex or having epigenetic alterations that uh, downregulate the MHC. And they also downregulate the immune system through an immunosuppressive environment, through tumor immune interactions. And there are many potential therapeutics that target specifically this. So the immune system can help select clones that are not recognizing, recognized by attacking highly antigenic clones. So the immune system is actively contributing 
to the immunosuppression of the tumor by basically killing those cells that are easily recognized and the rest of the cells can um, uh, grow. You could also have a lot of uh, uh, antigen generation by many different tumor cells that can then potentially overwhelm the immune system and then let other cells that are less antigenic survive. You can also find uh, these recurrent mutations in these HLA genes that repress MHC antigen presentation. So the tumor generates inhibitory ligands that suppress T-cell activity and immunotherapies can reverse this effect and actually promote T-cell activity. And that's you know, a major way that we've been able to reprogram the immune system to fight the tumor by basically sort of reactivating the immune system or overactivating the immune system. And what's really ironic is that if you have an autoimmune disorder, this can actually help trigger an immune response against the cancer. But what's also sad is that in some cases, by promoting immune uh, system function, you can actually trigger autoimmune disorders. So it's a fine balance between sort of overactivating the immune system, which will then start attacking cells, or uh, not overactivating it, which basically means it won't be attacking the tumor. Okay. So there's a lot of ligands through which these, uh, re these B cells are controlled. There's activating repressor, uh, receptors, and there's also inhibitory receptors. And the tumors will basically try to co-opt these by basically saying, oh, uh, don't worry, everything's going great by sort of binding on this side. And there are many immunotherapies that basically seek to specifically block this recognition by basically stopping the T cells from being repressed by the tumors and then sort of re-waking up uh, the, the body's defenses. So the tumors generate inhibitory ligands to suppress T cell activity. Immunotherapies can reverse this effect and promote T cell activity. And then autoimmune diseases can help trigger the immune response against uh, the cancer. You can basically start studying the neoantigens, basically the new non-self recognized peptides that can predict the immunotherapy success. So the more high is your mutational load, the more likely immunotherapy is likely to succeed. So the mutational frequency and the new antigen load are both correlated with response, response to these checkpoint locating immunotherapy. And the intuition is that even if the T cells aren't immunosuppressed anymore, they still need targets to be recognized. And that's a little bit of, a, again, a double-edged sword, where uh, patients that are smokers are sometimes responding to immunotherapy better because smoking is so uh, uh, mutational that you generate new antigens, and therefore their uh, cells are more easily recognized by the, by the tumor. But you still shouldn't smoke. It'll kill you one way or another. Um, you can actually computationally predict the uh, mutations that will be more easily recognized as neoantigens uh, and new epitopes by, uh, you know, sort of asking how likely is it that this particular new peptide will be, you know, presented as, a, you know, neoantigen. And there are tools that have been built that use, for example, neural networks based on a large number of you know, these peptides to basically be able to then build a classifier that says, if I have any one of these mutations, how likely is it that this mutation will be recognized as non-self by the immune system? And you know, depending on the tumor type, you can have more or fewer antigens, and you can basically use the intratumor heterogeneity of the neoantigen landscape, namely what are all of the mutations that are possibly recognizable as non-self, as neoantigen by the tumor. And you can use that to predict immunotherapy success. You can basically say, what is the clonality of this neoantigen space? And can I use that to separate neoantigens that are above or beyond some threshold of detection and then find those that are more likely to be recognized. So the, the question is, of course, how do the T cells recognize these uh, antigenic peptides in the first place? And the, the, the answer is basic immunology. So basically every T cell 
generates a unique T cell receptor, and that's known as the T cell repertoire through VDJ recombination. So you basically have these variable domains that come together to basically generate a new uh, antibody for every new uh, you know, foreign object out there. Everybody with me on this one, right? So once these are uh, you know, generated, you basically have your repertoire. And that's sort of the thing that you will be able to recognize in your environment. But we could actually sequence that. We can actually sequence the TCR repertoire of a person by basically just TCR sequencing. And you can call them directly from RNA-seq data. And there, you know, there are tools that allow you to do that. And that means that you can now determine the diversity of the T cell repertoire for that person across different cancer types and across distinct profiles in the tumors, and then use the correlation between the immune defenses of a person and the neoantigens of the tumor to basically find matched neoepitopes and PCR combinations. Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. Awesome. So that's the beauty of genomics. You can basically target the uh, you know, you can study the tumor, you can study the immune system, you can study the T cell repertoire, and you can basically find antigen specific T cells using these DNA barcoded peptide mutations of the MHC that can basically allow you to track cancer progression and see how the T cell repertoire interacts with new epitopes over time. And you can take that to a whole new level by basically designing cancer vaccines specific to the cancer cells of that person. You could basically utilize patient-specific neoantigen profiles to develop cancer vaccines to train the immune system of the patient to recognize the tumor. So the hypothesis is that these neoantigens that are specific to the tumor will be triggered by the vaccines and then lead to T cells and T cell recognizers uh, you know, T cell receptors that recognize those two new antigens, uh, those, those new antigens. And there's two major challenges. You, can, you have to identify both patient specific HLA allele specific uh, peptides. Basically, every person has their own HLA alleles, and these dictate the types of things that you'll be able to recognize. And then you need to validate that the synthetic peptide will assist in the tumor response. Okay? And there's a lot of work in doing this. You can basically uh, train specific to each HLA allele. There's, you know, 4,000 alleles of HLA-A, 5,000 alleles of HLA-B, 4,000 alleles of HLA-C, and you can basically combine high-throughput HLA binding assay peptides, to train a model, and then train a neural net using these data to now start predicting for a huge diversity of potential combination of these HLA alleles how the tumor, uh, how, how they will respond to the tumor uh, new antigen. And then to basically validate that efficiency, you can basically build a clinical trial. And indeed, um, Kathy Wu and um, uh, Nir Hakoen over at the Broad Institute have basically built such a trial where 16 personalized neoantigen vaccines were designed uh, for each patient. And then uh, you to basically sort of verify that indeed these were recognizing the, the tumor. And indeed, you basically find that in almost uh, all cases, these neoantigen pools uh, were successful. You can basically find that the patient T cells were in fact recognizing the mutation to the epitopes much more efficiently than the wild type epitopes. And you know, in all of these cases, you basically had either complete response or complete uh, you know, success after uh, a second treatment. So this is phenomenal. That basically means that we are now in an era where we can actually start using all of our knowledge of tumor biology and immune biology together to sort of build these treatments. This is, you know, one approach where you're basically using vaccines to train this. Another approach is to basically build these chimeric uh, proteins that allow you to target specific, uh, you know, antibodies that are raised against recurrent tumor antigens. You can basically look at the tumor, say what are the recurrent antigens, let's build a monoclonal antibody against those antigens, and then take out the immune cells of the patient, combine them with this new recognizer, 
this new antibody that is strained against the tumor and then reinsert into the patient uh, immune cells that are now able to recognize the tumor. I mean, this is science fiction, basically. This is basically taking the immune cells, training them, putting a, a chimeric receptor in there that will then sort of launch an immune response against uh, the, the tumor. And there's, you know, these T cell engagers that can be combined with this CAR T uh, therapy to basically uh, engage uh, the response against the tumor. So that's where we are. Basically, where we are is that, you know, as I mentioned, this lecture is bringing together <laughs> nearly everything we've heard so far from single cell profiling to sort of understanding the circuitry of the tumor the interaction between the tumor and the different types of immune cells, and then being able to sort of leverage our understanding of these molecular processes to then reprogram them and then fight tumors in a completely new way. And then again, immunotherapies are only one small part of this uh, very big picture. This is like this avoiding immune destruction uh, hallmark of cancer. And you know, I want you to really think about them in the context of everything else and then combine with everything else. Who feels that they've learned stuff today? Awesome, good. So basically what we talked about is the hallmark of cancer that sort of served as the framework for thinking about all this, and then the lessons from exome sequencing, the lessons from whole genome sequencing, going beyond mutations, and then understanding the relationship between tumor and the immune system and that interplay that we can now leverage for new therapeutics.